Live from the Business Radio X studio, welcome to Time Well Spent with Julie Hullock, your source for inspiring stories of busy people who have made more time to do what they love. Now, here's your host, Julie Hullett. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today is exciting for two specific reasons. Number one, this is the beginning of my second season of Time Well Spent. And number two, I have with me for our guest today, Julian Vaca. Julian is an author, actor, first-generation Mexican-American, and first-generation college graduate in his family. He's been a creative writer for over a decade. He was a staff writer on season three of PBS's Reconnecting Roots, a nationally broadcast show that drew in millions of viewers over its first two seasons. He's also a Penn Faulkner Writers in the School author, and he's appeared in multiple publications and recently debuted his first novel with the Memory Index. Julian lives in Nashville with his wife and four kids. Welcome, Julian. We're so glad you're here. Hey, Julie. Thanks for having me. So good to see you. Thank you. Um, now, we just said that that you had debuted your first novel, but actually you wrote your first novel in high school, right? I did. And um, after I wrote that, that manuscript, which will never see the light of day, um, <laughs> I, I, can, I can promise everyone listening that, um, and you're better off for it. Um, after, after that, I, and, you know, after high school and, and graduating you know, from college with a BFA, um, I then had uh, a few years in self-publishing. Um, and mm-hmm. so, you know, I've been, you know, immersed in, in creative writing for, for years and, and really trying to, you know, study the craft and, and get better with each subsequent book. Um, but my publisher and I decided to position uh, the memory index as my debut because, you know, yes, it's my, it's my first traditionally published book. Um, but beyond that, I have grown a lot since self-publishing. Um, and if I was bringing in new readership and new audiences into uh, into my world, I wanted their first uh, impression to be that of, you know, the memory index. Um, and I, I, what I didn't want to happen, what my team didn't want to happen was somebody reads the back copy of memory index is intrigued, but wants to see what else I have out there, picks up one of my self-published books on Amazon and thinks, oh my Gosh, I am not reading anything else by this this author because and and I know part of that is just you know the inner critic in me who who looks back on my other stuff and kind of cringes. Um, but I, yeah, all that to say, yes, technically, technically, I, I've I've released some other books and I've I've written other books. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> you and I first met when you were working at Bookman Bookwoman. Uh, for those new to Nashville, that was a wonderful bookstore in Hillsborough Village. I guess, Julian, that's been seven or eight years. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah. Okay. And a lot, obviously, from what you just said has happened during that time. So what is the path from book man, book woman to being published by Harper Collins? I mean, that's a pretty big yeah. jump, right? Yeah, it is. And and my my path to publication has anybody who knows my story knows just how truly uh, unorthodox and unconventional it is. Um, and Honestly, I just want to take a second to just um, recognize Sarah Lee and Larry Woods, the owners of Bookman Bookwoman, that that bookstore that you um, that you just mentioned in Hillsborough Village. Um, that was a magical place. It, you know, brick and mortar bookstores are a really special place, and, and Bookman and Bookwoman in particular was just it was just remarkable. Um, you know, people would come from all over the country to browse their their store, their 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 catalog. Um, and there's just nothing quite like, you know, having a conversation with a bookseller and, you know, mm-hmm. telling them what you just read and then asking them for their, um, you know, for their recommendation on what they should read next. Um, you just can't quite capture that with Amazon. Um, so anyway, I'm very grateful for my time at Bookman Bookwoman. But Sarah Lee and Larry, the, the owners of that store, they, they were the first bookstore to take a chance on me and stock my self-published books. And, um, you know, in that season, I was wearing so many different hats, Julie. I was the the marketer. I was my own agent. I was, um, you know, my own publicist. And, you know, you just wear so many different hats and you have to focus on the creative. You have to focus on telling a good story. 
Um, and so I did that for a few years. And then um, as my family started to grow, I, I pivoted and, and took a job in, in marketing. We needed, you know, we needed healthcare. We needed, um, you know, paid time off, you know, all those sort of things that come, all those amenities that come with a salary job. And so, you know, I continued to dabble in, in article writing, blog writing, copywriting, but in terms of like long form novel writing, it had kind of just kind of gone dormant. And then 2020 rolled around. Uh, this was January, actually, right before, you know, the pandemic totally changed uh, our reality. A friend of mine reached out and said, hey, I, I just got hired at, at, a, at a nonfiction imprint at HarperCollins. I'd love to take one of your manuscripts and, and you know, uh, pass it along to someone in fiction. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we we blew the dust off of one of my old manuscripts and cleaned it up, polished it, put together a proposal. And and by the way, at this point, I, I'm unagented. So I, so I don't have literary representation. So this is very unconventional right off the bat. And um, through my friend, we submitted a, a manuscript to um, to one of the acquisition editors. Long story short, uh, she came back eight or nine months later <laughs> around September <laughs> and said, sorry for the delay. Things have been crazy, as you well know. Um, we really enjoyed your book, but we're not keen on publishing something that you've already released. What else do you have in the works? And so then um, I went back to the drawing board, fleshed out some sample chapters for the memory index, put together a proposal. And um, by April of 2021, we were uh, deep in, in, in negotiations on, on a two book deal. And so here we are. <laughs> That's amazing. What a it's dream. very unconventional. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unconventional is usually good, in my experience. Um, and I think Nashville is really a great place for inspiring creativity. And most people think of that in the music world. and uh, But I think just art in general here, including writing, publishing, mm-hmm. things like that, is just huge and very supportive. And your story tells that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about what it's like to be an author. You know, in the movies, these guys are anxious and depressed and dark and usually drinking and they're calling their agent, and you know, frantic. What's a typical day like for you? Just like that. I mean, <laughs> there's really nothing else to to add to that. That's very accurate. No, there there is a lot of insecurity. There is a lot of self-doubt. There is a lot. There is there is some some drinking. Um, but um you know, it's what I have found is that because novels, as you know, in terms of uh, as an art medium, because there's they can be so lengthy and require such an investment of your time, you have to figure out a way to um, turn your writing time into a discipline. In other words, I can't just, and this is how, what I've learned for me, by the way, I should just say this, uh, yeah. you know, people, different writers work differently. Um but I, I can't wait to write until inspiration strikes. I, I've had to figure out a way to turn it into a disciplined sort of practice. It's like any other uh, muscle that you work out, any other muscle that you stretch. Um, so for me, I try to set daily uh, word word count goals for myself. You know, if my novel um, is, you know, going to be 85, 90,000 words, uh, that means I need to try and, you know, write 500 to 1,000 words a day. Hmm. Um and so, um, and, and a lot of that comes from, from my self-publishing days. You know, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. And so all the deadlines were self-imposed. And so that kind of mindset yeah. has now carried over and um, the urgency has never gone away. And so, um, you know, I obviously balance a, a nine to five. I didn't, I didn't get into writing because it's this incredibly lucrative endeavor and there's, you know, just money falling from the sky. Um, you know, uh, and, and in fact, I've actually heard someone, another writer say that authors shouldn't anticipate really starting to see, you know, revenue or, or, you know, um, actual money until their third or fourth book, um, mm-hmm. something like that. So all that to say, I have to balance family with my traditional nine to five, which is thankfully a creative job and allows for me to, you know, pursue my novel writing as well. Um, but to distill it down to, you know, a smaller answer, I think just figuring out ways to write every single day, whether that's 250 words or 750 or a thousand, um, that's what's worked for me. Okay. So you're calling your agent, you're drinking, you're frantic, you're depressed, 
you're working from home, I trust. And so then you've got four kids. um, And is your wife at home also? He works full time. And so we've been very, very fortunate in that we have a friend who uh, nannies for us and two of our kiddos are in school. um, And so only two of them are actually at the house. Um, But yeah, I divide my time between writing at home. And as cliche as this sounds, Julie, I love coffee shops. Okay. I, I I do a ton of writing in, you know, Frothy Monkey or or Dose over on Murphy Road, um, you know, uh, Humphrey Street over in Wedgwood, Houston. I mean, there's just something, again, as corny and cliche, as stereotypical as it sounds, you know, to hear the the just the chatter and the conversations right. and the din of a coffee shop really just kind of helps level set me. So my next question was going to be about how you carve out time for yourself, but are those two things one and the same? I think so. You know, I, with my, my full-time job being uh, remote first, it affords me the opportunity to sort of build out my schedule every single day. Um, So if I have a, a, you know, if I look at my calendar for the the forthcoming week and I see that I've got two meetings on, on, you know, Monday, three meetings on Wednesday and a couple on, you know, Friday, um, I can move stuff around to allow for some writing time in the morning um, or late in the afternoon before my my day ends. Um, and so I'm very fortunate in that I can do that. You know, we're having a totally different conversation if I'm working in a fulfillment center for Amazon or, sure. you know, whatever. And so I don't take that for granted that, that I'm in a position where I can sort of build out my schedule. But Again, so much of it is um, is is discipline and self motivation. Knowing that I've got deadlines that are that are looming, I need to build out my week so that I can hit my goals. So, yes, that coffee shop time is Julian time, really. Mm. Or this, I, I yes. Okay. And then when you do have free time, you know, you mentioned traveling with your family. Um, are those like road trips you're going on or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we have some dear, dear friends that live in Greenville, South Carolina, which okay. if you've not been and, and you're listening to this and, and you're looking for an excuse, you got to go to the Carolinas, but you got to check out Greenville. It's beautiful. And, um, so, so we've been wanting to see them since they've moved out there. And, um, we just decided, you know, we're going to take some time off, you know, around Christmas and we're going to just load up the the minivan and, and drive out and spend a couple of days with them. Um, and that was beautiful. We, we went to some restaurants, went to some parks while we were out there, did some sightseeing. Um, but the cool thing about it is I, I like to try and, um, you know, look for those kinds of opportunities to pop into local bookstores. And so there's, there's this lovely bookstore out there. It's kind of like Greenville's Parnassus. It's -hmm. called M Jetson. And so I just emailed them a few weeks before we were going to be out there and said, Hey, I'm going to be popping in any chance you have, you know, stock of my book. And if so, I'd love to sign it. And so um, we made a pit stop and, and I was able to sign some, some copies of the memory index and uh, they were very, very supportive. And um, so it was kind of cool to, Yes, obviously the the focus on that trip was seeing friends and family, but hmm. might as well stop in and, and sign some copies while we're there too, you know? Yeah, that's smart. Good planning. <laughs> yeah. Um well, let's talk about the memory index just for a minute. Okay. Yeah. I don't I don't want to give too much away. I really want people to read it. I enjoyed that very much. And you know, I'm an avid reader. I read mm-hmm. all kinds of books, but I was surprised. Um, generally I'm not a sci-fi person. But mm-hmm. how you were able to pull together dystopia, sci-fi, and historical fiction all tied up in memories. That was just, mm. that's brilliant. I think that's mm. a great strategy on your part. Thank you, um, Julie. Yeah. And I like the fact that you used your mother's maiden name, mm. uh, you know, always keeping their present. One of your interviews I read, you said your mother and father's memories were a bridge for you since you weren't taught Spanish growing up. And I I found that really interesting. Um, How did you learn Spanish? So uh, actually to this day, it's, it's, I don't, I don't consider myself Spanish speaking. It's broken, broken, broken Spanish. I mean, little phrases here and there. Um, And we've actually decided as a family that once our kids get just a little bit older, we're going to learn it with them. Um, That's a, that's a goal for us. Um, And I think it's important because, you know, my kids are, 
our mix. Uh, my, my wife is, uh, she's white. And so preserving uh, that piece of my heritage is, is that much more important, uh, you know, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, hearing those, those stories from, from my parents, my mother in particular, who immigrated from Mexico when she was eight or nine was super, super vital, super important to bridging the gap between, you know, my present and, and, and their past, which is of course my past as well. Um, and so I wanted to carry that kind of idea into, into this story. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, sci-fi dystopia, you know, historical fiction, all those sub genres and fiction. I think any good story is a, is really a, a cocktail of different genres anyway. And so that was, um, that was my approach. Okay. How can I come up with an interesting concept, an interesting conflict? Um, but then how can I bring in you know, different subgenres to hopefully make it that much more interesting and engage the reader. Um, so that was, it's, it's funny hearing you, you call that out because that was a very much a conscious decision going into the ideation stage of the story. And then, and, and again, I don't want to go any deeper, but it does, you ask some big questions in there, Mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me, you know? So, okay. One more question about writing and then I need to ask you about your time. Um, Yeah, Yeah. Do are you able to read other people's books? You know, the best men's holiday thing. Can you read a book without going, well, I would have done this or they should have used this technique or are you able to do that? I'm always curious about that. Um, the, the short answer is un- unfortunately, no. Once, <laughs> once, you, once you get that formal training and you've been in it for so long, um, you know, it's, it's impossible to be you know, completely objective at that point and just take that hat off and just enjoy something. However, I think that's a testament to a really good writer. Whenever I, if I read a book and I do forget if I'm chapters and passages into the book and I do forget that I'm reading a book, that's a, that's a testament to, yes. to their, to their writing. Um, one, one writer in particular comes to mind, um, Murakami, he's a Japanese writer. He's had, you know, all his books translated into dozens of, of, of translations and um, they're into dozens of languages, I should say. And um, I read the wind up bird Chronicle, which is a fantasy kind of, you know, story. And as I was reading that and, and really just kind of getting lost in his world, I forgot that I was reading a book. And so yeah. it, it, it happens, you know, where it's very rare, but there, there are some books that I'll read, Julie, where I, I, I'm able to just forget <laughs> that I'm also a writer and I'm, yeah, exactly. Um, and the same thing is for movies because writing, you know, in television, you know, really good writing makes a, makes the world a difference. Of course. Um, especially in this age where so many people are binging shows on Netflix and Hulu and Amazon prime. Um, so many people are consuming their, their entertainment through streaming and good writing really sets a, a show apart from, from the rest. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you had more free time, what would you do with it? Oh, that's a great question. I, I always tell people that writers are readers first. That, that's, that's what I always try to remind folks who are trying to get into creative writing. Writers are readers first. So if I was suddenly gifted, you know, more time, I think I would read more. Um, you know, it's um, reading is what got me into writing, obviously, and that may sound like an obvious statement, um, but I just, I get so much joy and I, and I feel so refreshed after I've spent quality time with, with a good book reading. Um, and then of course, you know, all, all the, all the corny answers, spending time with family, um, you know, spent spending time on, on, you know, my mental health and self-improvement, all of those kinds of things. Um, but certainly I think that the first, my gut reaction to that question is I think reading. Okay. So in 2023, how can you commit more free time for reading? And I'm asking that question because I'd like to give our listeners tips from my guests that they can use in their lives. So yeah. what, are you, what are you going to do differently? Uh, so I've actually given this some thought. And so um, I'm thankfully a little prepared here. Um, but as I was reflecting on 2022, I, and, and, you know, our smartphones are so smart these days and they can show <laughs> you, you know, uh, how much time you're spending on your phone. And I think the first big Thing that I can that I can really really take action on is spending less time on social media. Amen. Um, 
you know, I think cumulatively we spend hours and hours and hours o- o- across 12 months on any given year, just lost in the the doom scrolling as some have called it. Um, and so I think, you know, setting those, um, I don't know if, if, if you're familiar with this, but Apple has this wonderful tool where you can set timers for yourself for certain applications. So if just going in and setting your preferences with, you know, social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and only giving yourself three minutes a day, and then it'll ping you and say, all right, you've hit your max and that's it. Um, I know that if I, if I could buy back all of that time from 2022, <laughs> I'm sure I would have read, you know, twice as many books. Yeah. Good point. It uh, adds up. I, I agree. And that, that it is so easy. And when I get every Sunday morning, just as I'm walking into church, that message pops up that tells me about my usage for the week. And I'm always shocked. I mean, mm. <laughs> and I have tried that focus feature. I think that's what you're re- referring to. And I'll look at it and go, okay, just one more minute, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you'll snooze it. You'll snooze it. Yeah. yeah I got it. I, I've just got to get a hold of it, but um, thank you for answering that. Okay, um, I want to move now to a little word association, my lightning round here, you know. Oh, yeah. First thing. Okay, so you get to choose um, aisle or window. Aisle or window. Mm, window. Okay. Coffee or tea. Coffee. Beach or mountains. Beach. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. We're doing your eulogy. And you get to pick two words to describe you. Two. What would those, what would you want those words to be? Oh, I think loyal would be the first one. I, I, I would, I would hope that my friends and family would consider me loyal. And then two, I think loving. Loving would oh, be the nice. second word. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I know it's, I know it's word association and lightning round, so I'm not going to unpack that, but the, I think loyal and loving would be the two. And I didn't mean for that to be a, have alliteration there, but no problem. There you go. <laughs> I like it. I like <laughs> it. Okay. Um, to wrap up, Julian, what is the best ways? What are the best ways, sorry, for our listeners to connect with you and find you online? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the irony of being asked, what are some things that I can do to, to give myself more time? And, and now I'm plugging all my social media <laughs> <laughs> channels. Right. Uh, Not lost. And, and, yeah. Yeah. In, Instagram for sure is the tool that I found that to be the most useful. It's where I get to connect with readers the most. Um, you can follow me there and, um, just, you know, look for Julian Vaca. Um, and then also, um, uh, my website, Julian Ray Vaca. So J U L I A N R A Y V is in Victor A C A.com. Um, there's a message portal through there and I've been able to connect with, with folks through there. Actually, it actually just reroutes to my email inbox. Um, so Instagram and, and my website, are, I would say are the two best ways to get in touch. Excellent. Thank you for that. And Listeners, I encourage you to pick up a copy of the Memory Index, especially if you love to read like I do. It's just a great book. Thank you for that, Julian. Thank you, Julie. And thank you again for being here today. Thank you all for listening. If you have questions about the podcast, please connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram. I answer all messages. Thanks again, and we will see you soon. And now here is a time well spent tip. We all know work-life balance is important, but how do you achieve that when you're always busy? There is no one-size-fits-all approach to balance, so it's important to find what works for you. And that might mean waking up 20 minutes earlier than usual to enjoy your cup of coffee in silence Or it might mean you stay up 20 minutes later to write in a journal before you go to bed. Whatever you decide, keep it simple and make a routine of it. The more you pour into yourself, the more you'll be able to give to others. Thanks for tuning in to Time Well Spent with Julie Hullett. This show is brought to you by Julie Hullett Concierge, LLC, a personal concierge service in Nashville, Tennessee. Learn more at juliehullet.com.